Welcome to ChemHelp ASAP. In this video, we're going to talk about some common laboratory glassware that students encounter when they take undergraduate organic chemistry laboratory classes. So the glassware in the screen right now, th these are examples of what I consider to be the workhorse types of glassware that you encounter in the laboratory. For, for the most part, these are by far the most common types of glassware you encounter. So on the left, we have beakers. In the middle, we have Erlenmeyer flasks. And on the right, we have the round bottom flask. So let, let's just talk about what these are and what the most common use cases are for these types of glassware. So beakers, beakers are great for getting solutions and when I say solutions I mean um, let's say you need to make up 50 milliliters of 1% hydrochloric acid. Uh, beakers are a great container just to mix solutions like that. So th this is where you'll make the product. You might use different glassware to transfer in the reagents but this is what you have. Beakers are also really handy. Um, they can be actually used as weigh boats. Sometimes you want to weigh a, a, a large amount of solid and um, you might think out oh, this weighing paper, this weigh boat may not hold it. You can use a beaker on the balance instead. Completely legit. So beakers are, are good for making solutions. Um, they're good for solutions, particularly where you're not worried about evaporation because these do have kind of an open top and uh, you can get evaporation from those. So that, that, that be, that's what beakers are for. They're fantastic, they're versatile, they're useful, and you see them all over a lab. In the middle of the screen we have the Erlenmeyer flasks. So Erlenmeyer flasks are different from a beaker. Erlenmeyer flasks have this kind of conical shape. And these are particularly good if you have something that you're going to need to swirl around. The slanted sides help keep the contents in place. Um, they're good. Uh, sometimes you want to put a stir bar in something, you're going to be mixing it and maybe get some splashing. Again, conical sides work well for that. They're also good because if you're going to heat something up and don't want evaporation, it has a smaller surface area of exposure at the top, so there will be less evaporation that occurs in an Erlenmeyer flask. Regardless, for many times, if you want to make up a solution, Beaker's great for that. Sometimes Erlenmeyer flasks are good for that too. And I'll be honest, sometimes uh, which one I use is determined by what do I have clean on hand. If I have a clean 125 mil Erlenmeyer, I might use that over a 150 beaker. And as you can see, of all these flasks and beakers come in different sizes. Back here we have up to a 500 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask. I mean, these things can up to two liter and even bigger. But th these are kind of standard sizes you would encounter in a typical lab. Now on the right we have something a little more special. These are the round bottom flasks. And round bottom flasks are particularly good when you're going to stir things. Um, you'll encounter these in a lot of synthetic reactions. So uh, we'll stir things uh, and, and because everything falls to the bottom, that's a, the stir bar will fall to the bottom, and that's how we stir things. Note that round bottom flasks have this frosted glass joint, and this is called a ground glass joint. Now ground glass joints, are, they're really nice because they provide a great way to connect into other pieces of glassware. Now this is just a stopper, so that's not exactly a glamorous connection, but you can actually connect in, and we'll see in this video, other pieces of glassware where you can connect into more elaborate pieces out the top. So you can add further functionality to your uh, flask and things like addition funnels and uh, condensers and things like this. So these are great. These are also really good for heating. Um, and because you can put things on the top, you typically don't want to seal things that you're going to heat, but you can put condensers on the top. And so that way, if you do get loss of vapors, you can collect those vapors and return them to your flask. So these are particularly common in, in synthetic laboratories, whether that's an organic, uh, synthetic organic laboratory or maybe synthetic inorganic laboratory. Now again, these stoppers provide a way to seal things up. Um, th the ground glass, if you put other connections on the ground glass, it's easy for this ground glass to fuse together. It doesn't chemically fuse together, but if you get dirt in between, it makes the ground glass get stuck. Therefore, people are typ typically fairly particular about keeping these ground glass surfaces as clean as possible so that you don't stick things together because they can be a real bear to get apart. 
Now in this case, here's a round bottom flask, a 250 round bottom flask, and it has a rubber stopper in it. Uh, there's a septum. Septa are great because sometimes you want to run a reaction and you want to exclude air or moisture. And the septum gives you an airtight seal and you can actually run needles through this to allow uh, the inclusion of other other gases uh, besides air. You can include nitrogen, you can do argon, all sorts of things. So it's fairly common if you have air sensitive reagents to have a means of protecting your reaction from an air and we use a septum for that very often. Note that um, round bottom flasks, they don't sit on the bench top very well. They just fall right over. And so for that reason, you use these cork circles to provide a base uh, that, that will hold the, um, the round bottom flask. Now you can do kind of jakey things like put these into a beaker. That's not recommended. I think everybody's done it, but it's not best practice. Note that these cork circles typically come and uh, they have two sides, a top and a bottom, and they, the, the sides are typically different. So one will be flat and one will be a little um, concave. So the concave side, it lets you accommodate a different flask size from the other size. In this case, they both work. Let's see an example where they don't. This is a 100 milliliter round bottom flask. If we used it on this side, you'd see this, this doesn't quite sit. It still hits the bench top. But if we turn it over to get a, a narrower hole that one works well so there's some flexibility in how these cork circles are designed so these are the core workforce um, glassware that you'll encounter in a in a laboratory these are what i consider the the containers when you put things in here you're going to leave them in there for a while maybe to do a reaction maybe not but these are uh, just really container glassware the beakers the erlenmeyer flasks and the round bottom flasks Okay, let's talk about filtrations, and we'll, I'll also touch upon the idea of transferring reagents. So, it, it's very common in chemical reactions that you need to filter something. And there are really two kind of filtrations. There's a gravity filtration and a suction filtration. So, let, let's talk about the gravity filtration first. So, here is a funnel. This is a uh, gravity funnel. It, it's designed for liquids. It has a long, narrow stem, and so liquids will freely flow through that stem. And so to use this funnel, you'd want a piece of filter paper in here. And this is a pretty big funnel, so I have a pretty big piece of filter paper here. We can fold it in half. We can fold it into a quarter almost a quarter and then open it back up there's a little pocket so we can fold it back on itself now every lab has a drawer somewhere that is full of different filter papers filter papers that are big some are small but filter papers that do a different task and so here is a a funnel with a filter paper and it's ready for gravity filtration so we would simply take uh, let's say this flask is full of liquid we'd pour that in and the solids would be separated out they'd be caught in the filter paper and we get the liquid in the bottom but for gravity filtrations you typically don't want the solids you want the liquid in the bottom okay well what if I want to filter something and I want to collect the solid well for that kind of thing you typically use a Buchner funnel and a Buchner funnel, is, uh, these are these ceramic funnels. The Buchner funnel specifically has straight sides. There are other types of ceramic funnels, but the Buchner is probably the most common that you'll encounter. It has a filter plate in the bottom, and uh, we put a need to put a filter paper in there. Again, you will find this filter paper in this magic drawer that contains all the different filter papers in the laboratory. Now, the this uh, this requires a, this is a suction filtration. It's not driven by the gravity. It, it's by driven by suction. And so to do this, we need a, a special type of Erlenmeyer flask called a sidearm flask or a filter flask. Now this looks just like an Erlenmeyer flask, except for it has this nice sidearm. So um, this sidearm allows us to draw a vacuum in this chamber flask. So these sidearm flasks are typically heavier glassware because they have to withstand the pressures of having a vacuum or at least a partial vacuum pulled on them. And, and also we need to make sure we have airtight seals. So you put like a rubber adapter in the top 
and that gives you a nice snug fit against a Buchner funnel. You swirl your stuff, you pour it in there, the solid gets collected in the top, and the liquid comes through. Again, normally when you use a Buchner funnel, you want the solid, you don't care about the liquid, so this will very likely become waste. Now, when you use, you'll find in the collection of Erlenmeyer flasks, and here is a regular Erlenmeyer flask, you will find likely some of the filter flasks, flasks mixed in. If you just need an Erlenmeyer, don't use the sidearm version of the Erlenmeyer because you probably have fewer of these and if you get all these dirty there will come a time in lab where you say okay now I need a sidearm flask and you'll look around and realize oh I use all my sidearm flasks like Erlenmeyer flasks and now they're all dirty so if you just need an Erlenmeyer use an Erlenmeyer if you need the sidearm flask use a sidearm flask but try to keep their roles distinct now I have a couple other things in the hood one is this funnel. Note this is a short stem funnel. This is great for transferring solids. So if you want to uh, transfer some solids into a flask, you can use this kind of funnel. Notice it, it has a short, wide stem that's good for solids. The longer stem is for liquids, longer, narrow stem. Now there's one other uh, piece of type of glass where I want to highlight, and that's the pipette. These um, these glass pipettes. These are disposable pipettes. You can probably find boxes of these in the laboratory. This happens to be like a nine inch pipette. There's also a like a five and three quarter size. And these work with a rubber bulb. So you take the pipette and you just barely roll this this thick rubber ring of the pipette onto the end and that gives you an airtight seal and allows you to use this to suck up liquids as you let the bulb expand. Now I don't know what it is about these pipettes but when people suck up liquid into them their initial temptation, in fact let's go ahead and do this fortunately there's some water within reach perfect okay no not perfect but uh, we got the water transferred so now we can suck up water in here great now I, can, now I can do whatever I want with this water. I can squirt it into another flask. I can rinse something off. Now, when students have this, they seem to have this innate fear that the, that the liquid is going to drop out the pipette. And so what they do is they want to turn this upside down so that the liquid doesn't drip out the end. But if you turn it upside down, the liquid goes into this bulb. And so you, kn you don't know where this bulb has been. It could be filthy. And so you don't want to mix your liquid, your precious liquid, with this potentially filthy bulb because these bulbs tend to get reused. So just keep these vertical. Surface tension will typically maintain the solution in the pipette. Now that doesn't always work for organic, every organic solvent, but certainly it does for aqueous solutions. So those are the basics of filtering and transfers and the type of glassware that we use for these tasks. So now on the screen we have the, the glassware that we might use to measure things. And I'll try to use some uh, good examples and bad examples. But very often you need to measure uh, quantities and typically that often, often that's, a, that's a volume of a liquid. So how do we measure these volumes? Well, we measure volumes typically through graduated cylinders. So, that, so that's great. We have a graduated cylinder. We can pour liquids in here and we can know what the volume is. For most work in an organic chemistry lab, the, the precision of a graduated cylinder is just fine. So if I need 100 milliliters of a solvent, measuring that with a 100 milliliter graduate is completely adequate. So there are other ways to more precisely measure volumes. And you may be familiar with volumetric flasks. These are far more accurate, very precise in making up solutions. We often don't need that level of precision in an organic chemistry laboratory. But if we do, we would use something like a volumetric flask. Regardless, you're probably not going to see a whole lot of volumetric flasks in an organic laboratory. Most synthetic laboratories are, have a lot of graduates, not so many volumetrics. Now, you may have seen graduations on other glassware. For example, here is a nice Erlenmeyer flask and it has graduations. And it might make sense to you, well, I'll just use this to get my 100 milliliters of solvent. That may be okay for your use case, but these graduations on beakers and Erlenmeyer flasks typically are, are very rough estimates. So if you wanna have some confidence in your number, then I would recommend using a graduated cylinder instead. 
there are times in which you want to transfer a liquid but that liquid can't be exposed to air there are reagents that that aren't stable in air so we've already mentioned earlier in this video the idea of using a round bottom flask with a septum in the top to protect the contents from air well there are ways to transfer things without exposing them to air as you would with a graduated cylinder and that involves using a syringe so this is just a plastic syringe there are also glass syringes uh, quite a bit more expensive than these it depends on what you're working with some reagents tolerate plastic just fine others will react with plastic so you need to use a, a gla glass barrel syringes but we can just put a needle on these and we can draw up a, an amount of liquid there are different techniques you use for this to make sure you don't get bubbles and such and then if we want to add it to the flask we can pierce the septum stick the needle in and dispense our reagent um, again there's a lot more technique with this you'll need to have uh, air equal pressure equalization um, needles and stuff like that in these flasks but it, in concept you can do it you, if you have something that's air sensitive you can transfer it and have confidence in the volume that you're transferring now sometimes I've actually used pipettes pipettes are very imprecise but these longer pipettes they have about a two milliliter capacity if you fully squeeze down the bulb and let it in so sometimes I you know I'll use things like uh, a glass pipette as a rough estimate but if you want to know with with really any accuracy you'll need to use a graduated cylinder for transferring the liquids now one thing I haven't mentioned here is how do you transfer uh, solids and measure solids well we, we use a balance for that so for solids we we use a balance to get the mass for liquids we use graduated cylinders typically to get the volume this is a really fancy piece of glassware that you see in almost every laboratory and um, for some reason movies and such also love when they show a chemistry laboratory they always show this kind of uh, glassware this is called a separatory funnel now we talked about funnels as a way to transfer things um, a separatory funnel is not really a way to transfer things as much as it's a way to separate nonpolar solvents from polar solvents or maybe I should say um, solvents that aren't soluble in each other and the most so common solubility difference involves water so solvents that mix with water and solvents that don't mix with water so what happens with this glassware we're gonna put different solvents in this glassware and if they're insoluble one layer will separate from the other layer and the more dense solvent will sink to the bottom and the less dense solvent will sink, uh, float to the top and then by putting them in this sub funnel we can actually drain out the bottom layer through this stopcock and this uh, this white material is actually Teflon or step Teflon stopcocks we can drain the liquid out until we get to the separation between the two layers we stop it and then what's on top will be our less dense layer and of course we could collect what comes out the bottom in an Erlenmeyer flask or a beaker some type of container glassware so this is a really common piece of glassware to encounter in a laboratory. It's great for uh, what would they call liquid liquid extractions. We have two different liquids that we're separating from each other. And it's a great way to, uh, oftentimes for us, it's to get salts and polar materials out of our relatively nonpolar organic material. So we'll have a stopper in the top. We take these. We'll see examples this, of this in later laboratories. We shake stuff up, let them mix let the layers settle and then we drain it out the bottom after we open the top so we'll see this glassware in action but y you see this all over all over the place including Hollywood this is called the separatory funnel so these these barely fit on the screen but uh, these are examples of stands and clamps in lab um, the stand is the thing with the base and the vertical bar and then the vertical bar gives you a way to attach accessories so here is here's a ring that uh, was given a rubber lining to make it softer and I, I showed this just a moment ago to as a way to hold up a separatory funnel here is a clamp a three-prong clamp this is a classic these come in different sizes this is a little bit bigger one but these are made so you can grab hold of glassware and then attach everything to these um, to these posts on, on the stand now one thing to be careful of 
when, when you clamp glassware, uh, if you have a large apparatus that that has some height, you might want to clamp it in multiple places. It's very it, you have to be very careful when you clamp things in multiple places because it's easy to put on one clamp, and then when you put on another clamp, you put a lot of tension and you start to try to bend your glassware. And um, this is a newsflash: glassware doesn't bend; uh, it tends to break. So just be really careful if you're going to clamp things in multiple places. Oftentimes, people say clamp it in one place, but then su provide support in other places. Regardless, uh, normally what we're going to use clamps for is to clamp glassware into place. So we might do a suction filtration and we may want to clamp down our glassware to make sure it doesn't happen to fall over by accident. Do, do be careful with your glassware. If you have any concerns about something falling over, there's an easy solution to that. Stick it in a clamp and then it won't fall over because um, when things fall over they tend to spill and it's very hard to recover sometimes from a spill and you lose all your material. So re really easy, just clamp it in place and you won't deal with that problem. Now, on this, in this little clip, I want to talk about one other thing. I want to talk about tubing in lab. So, uh, tubing has different purposes. This is a uh, heavy wall tubing, a uh, vacuum tubing. This is suitable if you want to uh, apply suction to something. So, and you want to transfer the vacuum to your glassware. Uh, doing a suction filtration, you would use this heavy black wall tubing. So you can see that's pretty thick stuff. <laughs> this, this tubing has some mileage on it. Um, so there is narrower wall tubing and that would be something like this amber tubing which you tend to find in laboratories. These are great for water lines when you need to move water from the sink in through, through your glassware. We'll see glassware that does that in a second. This, this is fine for water but it, it, this will not hold up to a vacuum. If you put a vacuum on this it would suck down and collapse. So uh, amber tubing is typically used for water and condenser lines, uh, not vacuum. For vacuum, you need the heavy wall tubing. Finally, another type of tubing that you may or may not encounter in an intro organic lab is uh, this type of tubing. This is Tigon tubing. Um, ty Tigon tubing is often used, uh, it's actually often used in the food service industry. But this is really good for transferring gases. If you need to keep a reaction under nitrogen or argon or some inert atmosphere, this is great for moving gases. So typically, Tigon is for gases, amber tubing is for. Uh, water, almost always just water, and then finally we have uh, the heavy wall tubing for vacuum lines. So on the screen we have a stir plate. Now this is a stirring hot plate. The stirring hot plate will have two dials. Um, for the stirring you want to make sure you're turning on the stirring side and on the plate I have an Erlenmeyer flask and that, and that dark thing is actually a stir bar. It's a magnetic stir bar. It's got a little bar magnet in it, uh, or maybe it's just a piece of metal, but it interacts with the magnet in the stir plate, and that spins. Now, these stir plates are set up. There's something underneath this ceramic plate that is spinning around, and of course, it has an axis. So you want to put your your glassware with the stir bar right in the middle of the plate, and that'll give you the most efficient stirring. Very often, students will run into problems where they can't get their stir bar to stir. So there are a couple tips for that. One, make sure that your glassware is right in the middle of the plate. Number two, you want to make sure that your, your glassware is as low on the plate as possible. Sometimes you'll have something clamped above a stir plate and you'll have it like clamped up here. It, the closer to the stir plate, the better the stirring. Another trick is to start out on, some people will say, okay, I want to stir something, and they'll crank up their stir plate, and then they'll put it on, and they'll find it doesn't work. Get it on there with the plate off, and then slowly increase and get this, the stir bar going, and slowly increase it. Now, if you have something really thick in your flask, it, you know, you may not be able to get it to stir the way you want. Maybe you need a bigger stir bar. But it really, really thick contents in this flask will, will prevent this stir bar from stirring properly. So, you know, it, it's a case-to-case -case basis. But, but those are some really simple trips, tricks. Keep it in the middle, keep it down low, and slowly increase your stirring rate. Now, this is also a hot plate. 
and so we can adjust the heat this hot plate is a pretty fancy hot plate it has a temperature dial on it and it tells you about how hot the surface is going to get most hot plates uh, at least most pop hot plates that I use don't have that they have like this arbitrary uh, temperature scale of like 0 to 10 well many hot plates get really hot and when I say hot I mean they're like crazy hot they can get hundreds of degrees Celsius hot so when using a hot plate always start at low heat settings don't just crank it oh I want this to heat up quickly I'm gonna crank it up to 10 you, you're gonna burn yourself you're gonna break glass where you're it, it's gonna cause all kinds of trouble so easy does it on the hot plates because hot plates can the, honestly they can be dangerously hot so treat them with respect and uh, start with lower settings not higher settings also there's this old adage in lab a lot of things look the same when they're hot as they do cold it's easy to see a hot plate and just so okay I'm done with this I can grab it and all of a sudden you burned yourself because you grabbed a hot plate that still holds a lot of heat so be, be very careful with hot plates treat them with respect and um, you know help others uh, be safe around these these hot plates to wrap up this video, we're going to just see sort of a mishmash of different types of glassware. I'm going to start on the left with watch glasses. Now, almost everybody encounters watch glasses in the laboratory. Um, these are fantastic. If you've collected a solid and you wanted to let it air dry, uh, spreading out the solid on a watch glass is a great method for that, to leave it for a couple days and make sure it, it dries in the air. Of course, there are smaller watch glasses, and obviously there are going to be even bigger gl watch glasses, but those are just representative examples. Now, in the middle here, we have all these weird-shaped things. This is, this is something called a Dean Stark trap. This is a, a, a condenser, um, so it it's a, has a water jacket in here where you can put water. Water goes in the bottom, comes out the top, and that'll keep things cold if you're generating vapors below and you want to collect those vapors and return them to the flask. Um, this is called a, a distillation head. This is a way to purify uh, glass where you'd use to purify a liquid based on distillation. So I, I don't show these to, to help you really understand all the glassware. Just You see a lot of funky shaped stuff in the lab, and it all has a specialized purpose. And when you, when you need to accomplish a certain goal, you reach for one of these types of glasswares because they will help you accomplish that goal. Notice that all these uh, glass, these examples of glassware, they all have these ground glass joints. And so these are made to fit into things like the round bottom flask that we saw before. And so they fit together and you, you can assemble larger um, glassware setups by connecting these pieces together. Of course, the joint sizes have to match. So th this is one size of joint. This is called a 2440 joint. This is one of the standard sizes you encounter. And that fits nicely into this, um, this still head. And you can see we could put another flask or receiver of some sort off of this end. The other common size that you encounter is this smaller size. This is a 1420 joint. And the 1420 joint does not fit with the 2440 joint. So if your glassware is limited by what sizes of joints you have, but in modern glassware, 2440 and 1420 are the two common ones. Uh, other ones appear here and there, and if you get into someone's old glassware collection, you'll find all sorts of different sizes, but these are the two standard sizes. Regardless, you will see in laboratory different pieces of glassware that have all kinds of different designs. Those are specialized pieces for specialized functions and as you do more chemistry in the laboratory sometimes you'll need those functions and so you'll try to find one of these fancier pieces of glassware. I hope this video helps you understand glassware that you'll see in a common organic laboratory. Please uh, subscribe, like, or leave a comment. Take care.